We start with a point. Once again, Rob Bryanton here at the Imagining the Tenth Dimension video blog, and today we're talking about something that happened uh, in August uh, when the original Imagining the Tenth Dimension animation was posted at Boing Boing. And uh, of course, famous author, blogger, and Creative Commons enthusiast Cory Doctorow is in charge of Boing Boing, so it was quite exciting for me when that animation was posted over there. Now, as usual, the comments are a mix there. If you go to the uh, link we'll put up for you, you'll be able to see that. Some people angrily dismissing the whole thing as drivel and a smaller contingent of people who appear to get where I'm going with my project. So I'd just like to read you the comment I posted at Boing Boing, and uh, this is uh, quite a long comment and uh, not uh, really going to be a lot of new information here for you if you've been uh, reading this uh, blog or viewing this video blog, but uh, it's just sort of my attempt to sum up uh, what uh, I think is a good response to people who are critics of Imagining the Tenth Dimension and the original animation. Hi, Rob Bryanton here. I made this much discussed video and as a long time fan of Boing Boing, this is quite an honor. Thanks very much to Cory Doctorow and Bowl of Toast for their interest and thanks to those of you in the comments who understand the intent of this animation. As I say at the end, this is not the explanation for string theory, but it does have interesting connections to a lot of different schools of thought for a lot of people, and that's why it continues to be watched and why it's been translated into so many other languages. Do I hope that this video has started people thinking about big picture ideas and encouraged some to learn more about cosmology, the multiverse, and quantum mechanics? Of course I do, and every day I hear from people thanking me for waking them up to these possibilities. When I came up with this way of visualizing spatial dimensions 25 years ago, I'd not heard of the point-line-plane postulate, but it is very related. That postulate is accepted as a way of conceiving of any number of spatial dimensions, and that's what we're talking about here. Spatial dimensions, each one at a new right angle to the one before. Trying to view a representation of a 4D hypercube without using time to rotate that object is a good way of thinking about how time, for us, is just one of the two possible directions in the fourth spatial dimension. And uh, we'll put up a link to uh, Hypercubes in Plato's Cave, which is one of the uh, blogs talking about that, and another one called Time as a Direction. I published my book and this animation in 2006. In 2007, physicist David Deutsch supervised a team of scientists at Oxford to publish a proof equating the branching possibilities resulting from chance and choice with the probabilistic outcomes of the quantum world. New Scientist magazine went on to call this one of the most important science news stories of that year. And uh, we'll put up a link to that article. The Deutsch team's proof in my video both show a way of visualizing Everett's many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Everett proposed that the quantum wave function is not actually collapsed, but merely observed in different states. In that regard, this way of thinking shows how free will can exist, and yet all possible outcomes could already exist within a timeless underlying fabric. Physicist Tim Palmer's invariant set is receiving a lot of attention this year because it also confirms the validity of this approach. And uh, we'll put up a link to Invariant Set. Physorg.com has just published a very positive story about Palmer's work, and uh, here's a link to that uh, going by on the screen now. This year, well-known physicist Brian Green has come out to say that he now accepts the idea that the other different initial conditions universes are not merely theoretical, but just as real as our own. This multiverse is another idea that is central to my approach to visualizing the dimensions, which was much less in vogue back in 2006. And uh, we'll put up a link to Does the Multiverse Really Exist? Another important point to note is that this way of visualizing the dimensions does show a way of visualizing how the fifth dimension and above are curled up at the Planck length from our perspective. It's because our space-time reality is not continuous, but rather divided up into quanta. And for more about this, uh, you could look at blog entries like Slices of Reality or the Holographic Universe. There are a few questions that come up again and again with my project. What would a flatlander really see? Aren't there really 11 dimensions? Why stop at 10 dimensions? If you go to my website, you'll find many more connections. 
And as I've mentioned in my comments here, I have a YouTube channel where I've posted 250 different videos, I guess it's almost 300 now, that discuss the huge cloud of ideas that can be connected to this way of visualizing the dimensions. Since my day job is composing music and designing sound for film and television shows, you'll also see that my project has 26 songs attached to it, and uh, one of the songs is called The Anthropic Viewpoint. For those of you who are angered by a non-physicist trying to get people to think about cosmology and the really big picture, I can only say that the goal of my project is to stimulate people's brains into considering new possibilities. My next book is called O is for Omniverse, and it boils all these ideas into what looks like a children's alphabet book, full of brightly colored pictures and bouncy poems. My most popular blog entry of all time is called Creativity in the Quantum Universe, and that's what this is all about for me. Creativity. Sincerely, Rob Bryanton. Now, according to Wikipedia, Corey was the first person to release a novel under the Creative Commons license. I'm sure he'd be happy to see that my books are also being distributed freely on BitTorrent. Isn't it amazing how more and more people around the world are coming to this project? As I said last month, by the time I'm being satirized on collegehumor.com, it seems like we're crossing some kind of threshold here. That's cool. My name's Rob Bryanton. Enjoy the journey. And next time, we're going to look at poll number 42 from the uh, text version of the blog. And the question was, does Twitter connect or distract? That's all for now. Thanks.